apologies. I'm just aware the chairman's having some difficulty uh, thoroughly from the end of the meeting. Uh, and Emma, we see that you're there on Starley from have confirmed that everything's fine with you. Does anybody have any declarations of interest other than those that are already recorded on the register? No? Everybody fine? Lovely. Uh, right, then we'll move to the draft minutes. There's a couple of typos in the draft minutes, but it's more presentational than anything of note. Do you want the details of those? Are you content that those have already been fixed? It's just a, a time a time and a, a rogue colon. Right. Everybody happy enough? Happy Does anybody enough. have any matters arising from the minutes? No. no. There's just a there's a couple that the, the clerk has notified me of um, with regard to correspondence from the Department of Finance and the budget plans for the audit office uh, and the Assembly Commission. I'd refer you to those at page twelve of your pack. Greta, do you want to summarise or um, yes, to the Chair. Um, as expected from our last meeting, there's been some slippage in the timetable for the spending review. It had been intended to hold the second set of evidence sessions with the non-ministerial bodies today uh, in order to present the committee position and in turn a, a draft committee report. Um, we have been notified through um, the Departmental Assembly Liaison Officer there, it's in members' packs. Um, of a delay and subsequent receipt of comment from the Department of Finance, which this committee um, would take into account when agreeing its position. Um, I just noticed on Twitter this morning there was a story that the spending review is aiming to conclude by late November. Um, so if the Department of Finance were in a position to provide their comment after that date, um, we could schedule a further committee meeting uh, we had indicated perhaps the 18th of November with a draft committee position agreed the following week or even into the 2nd of December. So um, if members are content with that, we would um, obviously keep that date under review in light of what happens with the spending review and then schedule the evidence sessions accordingly. Members have views on this. I would outline this stage that I'm not free on the 18th, but that doesn't preclude everybody else from proceeding. 18th uh, Wednesday. Yeah. What time are you talking about? It'll be this quarter past twelve to quarter to two slot. As, as the 18th may actually be too early, just depending on when the spending review outcome is. Um, well, if you're talking it about the end of November, it could yeah. be it could be, be end of early December. Better push it back a week, but you know. Yeah. You want to push the 25th then? You do Members that. with that. Yes, I'll be there for that. Well, I can do that on the second. We could we could pencil in the twenty fifth and then just take a decision closer to the time when yep. we know more details about the spending yep. review. Okay. Right, that's agreed, lovely. And then if we can move to the next item, which is correspondence from the clerk uh, of the assembly or to the complaint standards authority. I'm afraid to page thirteen of your meeting pack. This is um, with regard to the committee's letter in relation to the initiation of the legislative process to establish an so as a complaint standards authority. Was provided for in Part Three of the Public Services Ombudsman Northern Ireland Act 2016. Is everybody content with this? Any comment? No. All happy. Okay. Four point three then. In terms of matters arising, is uh, comparative research on the variance thresholds. Uh, you'll recall this from the meeting on the 16th of September that the committee agreed to commission research on variance figures and thresholds. Um, environment that apply to, sorry, that apply in relation to comparator bodies. Um, this was requested to inform a committee decision in relation to agreeing a budget threshold of overstroke underspend between the Assembly Commission. You'll, you'll recall it was proposed to be 10%, but that was a amount of money. And, uh, <coughs> so we agreed we would check out the position in other places. Um, it was anticipated that, that paper would be provided today, but we've had some difficulty. Uh, getting receipt of the information from other jurisdictions, so we'll be at the next committee meeting. Members happy enough with that? I'll take that as a yes. Uh, questioning skills and online training. Um, you'll recall this was about, um, and see the chair has joined us. Hello, Daniel. Um, so, with regard yes, to questioning skills. I think we're quite Sorry, Daniel, could you just repeat that? I'm struggling to hear you. No, 
quite bad, so I'll, I'll, I'll be coming in and out. I can pick up most of it, but thank you very much. Yeah. No, that's no problem. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, so we had requested some additional information with regard to this training on effective questioning. Greta, do you have an update for members? I just um, undertaken to provide further detail. I spoke to CAMS and they indicated that it was a 30-minute session and it was online. The health committee um, were able to uh, um, have it delivered via Starleaf. And just in light of our sessions today, that um, the, obviously the 90-minute session wasn't suitable for this particular meeting. But um, if members are content, we could perhaps explore the opportunity um, for members to perhaps avail of that outside a formal committee meeting on a drop-in basis, perhaps, if members wish to explore that option. Is it not something that's been provided to all the scrutiny committees, of which we are all members? You know, members of the scrutiny committees? Ah, it, it could be combined as um, perhaps with other committees um, on a drop-in basis, as I say, just outside the normal committee meeting, which would obviously give um, more scope for us then to schedule our own formal briefings. <coughs> Unless there's another committee that would permit me to attend. If members have another mechanism to attend, maybe the thing to do is to find me a place that I can of the training. Mm -hmm. and explore that, yeah? Mm. Okay. I'll um, find out more information and get back to you, Joanne, if Just members are concerned. Others have an opportunity elsewhere then, and are you know, going to avail of that, then there's no point in something specific for us. But I'm certainly keen to avail of it. <laughs> if other members want to even consider it, then maybe just let the committee office know if you have any views. Daniel, I'm okay with that. All right. Okay, we're going to move into the next item of business. So for that, it's, it's with regard to the power of the powers of the org committee. Our members agreed that we now move into closed session. Yes. Okay. So members, we're about to move into closed session. Could I ask Assembly Broadcasting to ensure? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Members, we're now back into public session. Uh, and I refer you to pages 34 to 39 of the meeting pack. Members are asked to note this information which was requested at the meeting on the 7th of October and also that we'll discuss that more fully once we uh, get into the budgets with the various organisations, right? Um, likewise, uh, then we're on to NIPSO um, and a presentation from them with regard to their annual report. Uh, this session is going to be recorded by Hansard. I don't think we have members by Starleaf. If they're coming in in person, isn't that right, Alvin? Could you bring them in, please? Um, John McGinnis is by Starleaf. Oh, John, by Starleaf. Mm -hmm. All right. So, if Assembly Broadcasting could bring John in, please. Can we move the members out of the spotlight, please, for now? No. John, if he wants to meet himself. The folks who are with us online want to meet themselves. Please. John, would you meet yourself for us, please? Yeah. Okay, we're getting really bad feedback. Getting some feedback oh, from your speaker. Thank you, Could you mute yourself, please? Oh, sorry, mute myself. Yes, please. Thank you. It's just we're getting some feedback from the speaker. There we go. All right, that's us all now. <laughs> yeah. Margaret, thank you. It's good to see you back with us again. We're seeing you quite frequently. Paul, same to you. Um, so, uh, and also we have then John, who's the director of finance, joining via Starleaf. 
Um, I would invite you, Margaret, to make a short opening statement, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to, I apologise for this, but I'm going to have to limit your time to three minutes on the basis that we're under pressure in terms of another committee coming in in 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Indeed. I can't speak fast. Thank you. Um, so you will have noted our 2019-20 Ombud Public Services Ombudsman report. You will have noted it was our 50th year which was quite an occasion, and also the first year in which the total number of complaints to the office exceeded the 1,000 mark. Um, I've given you a breakdown previously of all of those statistics. Um, since the creation of, of NIPSO under the 26 legislation, we have seen the complaints rise year on year. In 2015-16, there were 477 complaints in total, so a rise of 119%. And we believe that that is a increase in inquiries and complaints that's both significant and will be sustained. Um, it is likely in the current year that we will have seen a little drop around the COVID period and, and I think that mirrors other ombudsmen. Um, but it is really that rise in complaints is one of the reasons that I want to focus on education, awareness of best complaints handling practice and shared learning to ensure that we really contribute to improvements in public service delivery for the citizens of Northern Ireland. Um, the report shows that we've made more decisions and complaints and increased the number of complaints concluded at both first and final stages. In 2019-20, we closed 96 stages at the investigative stage, which is the highest ever investigative output for NIPSO. 72% of all cases we take to that final stage were upheld either fully or partially. And across the board, we identify issues or failings that require some, more, some form of resolution in around 45 to 50 per cent of all our cases. I would just like to draw the committee's attention to the first stage investigation, as that's the point at which we will often seek alternative resolution and settlement. And at our last meeting, um, Chairwoman, I think you asked me about best outcomes, and I would just reiterate that enabling both settlements and resolutions are a good example of what might be the best possible outcome for a complainant and doesn't always necessitate a costly and lengthy investigation. And there are a number of examples in the annual report, so I not draw your attention to them. Um, in terms of sectors, just very briefly, you will see that health continues to be the biggest area um, of complaint. And you will note that there are a number of other areas that are in and around the 10% mark, education, local government, housing sectors, um, and they have all risen substantially. Um, one of the areas that I think I flagged with the committee before is social care and a real concern from us that the confusion around the complaints landscape means we're not seeing the number of social care complaints that we think we would be seeing or in fact enabling us to work with social care providers to make sure that they're handled well. <coughs> Um, in the annual report, we do focus on the strategic importance of supporting learning and improvement and working with others, but of necessity, this has been ad hoc because without the dedicated resources to enable a more strategic focus, we just quite simply haven't been able to do that combined with the um, rise in the number of complaints. We have undertaken some joint work with the Information Commissioner's Office and the Audit Office on the importance of good record keeping. And we have had a move to ensuring that the very vast majority of our reports are published on our website. And we only don't publish if there are interests, if there are um, public interests or identification issues that we think we need to not publish. But in the main, we publish all of our reports. Um, I think that it's really important for us that we use that employment and, uh, improvement and learning and that we use it to drive a broader range of, of change and outcomes. And I think that is one of the things that I really do want to focus on going forward. Um, I'm just going to stop briefly before I commend the report to you because I know that John wanted to give a very brief update on our annual report and accounts for committee. Um, which are due, in fact, are slightly overdue, I think. So if that would be OK, just to ask John to update you on that. But otherwise, I would commend um, the 2019-20 report to the committee. Could I just ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring John into the spotlight, please? And I hope that was three minutes. And unmute himself. Hello. Hello, John. Thank you.
you very much. John, can I just ask you, you, you please forgive me, but we're under time pressure. Can I ask you please to make your remarks as brief as possible, please, to allow time for members? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, it's just to, just to give you a, an account of where our annual report and accounts are at. As the Ombudsman has just said, we would ordinarily have those for the committee to consider at this point. There are three main contributory factors to the delay. Firstly, the COVID-19, which has a general delaying factor on all bodies' annual report and accounts. Secondly, in mid-August, we, we had received some guidance from the Department of Finance that caused us to look at the uh, a, a backdated holiday pay issue, which had quite a significant impact on our financial statements, ultimately. And thirdly, um, with Margaret having just joined us in the ninth, on the 19th of August, it was necessary to significantly rewrite much of the narrative that had already been written uh, when Paul was acting ombudsman. So that is, the, a combination of those factors has led us to a point where, as I speak to you today, we, we have the final version of the accounts with the audit office. We expect them to be certified by the end of this week or at latest early next week. So. Uh, I think I leave it at that, and if, if there's any comments or questions, I'm happy to take them. Open the floor to members. First of all, members here with me in the room. Jim Allen, do you have anything? I, I, I'd like anything? to ask. Um, you, you wrote to us, and you told us that uh, of the 1,043 complaints, 324 of them were. Uh, not pursued because they were outside of remit. Within that, you have the category of alternative legal remedy available. That one, I think, is a bit tricky because with most incidents of maladministration, theoretically, there could be a judicial review. So it's a facility where you could knock out complaints on that technicality, but practically for most people it's not a viable option because of the threat of costs which are excessive. If somebody's eligible for legal aid, yes, they've nothing to lose, but if they're not, taking a judicial review is a big undertaking in terms of the risk of cost. So is it fair to use the category of alternative legal remedy not to investigate something? Um, I, and this, all of those, I would say, each of those categories can either be straightforward or complex. And there is often, within, with each case within those, a real degree of complexity. And the team do look at that in detail. I'm going to ask Paul just to take you through the process on that, because he's more familiar at this stage than I am. Sure. Yeah. I think I mean, this, this comes from a specific provision in the, the legislation, mm. um, which means that the OMS is unable to take forward complaints where there is an alternative legal remedy available. And I think the general point to make there before I go into the, the, the detail of that is that I suppose that is there to reflect the Ombudsman's role as the alternative to the courts. And indeed that's the, the advantage of the Ombudsman in many ways is you're not taking things through the court process and it's as free and accessible as a service. You're absolutely right that it is not viable for many people to pursue that and that is the assessment that's made and that can be quite complex at times. It's assessing is it a reasonable alternative legal remedy for that person. Now, obviously, there's a whole range of factors in there, but often where we are determining that that is unavailable, that we can't pursue that, and this can also actually arise later on at the investigative stage or the first or second investigative stage, um, is where proceedings have been commenced by the individual. Um, and, and in that case, it is not possible usually for us to determine that it's not reasonable for that person to pursue that where they actually have preceded those, uh, commenced those proceedings. So it's always a case-by-case -case approach, but we do take into account the fact that it's not always viable. It's a very subjective judgment, then, that you make. It's always on a case-by-case, on-the-facts basis, absolutely. Um, so do, if do, someone do, says, uh, I could take a judicial review, but I can't afford it, and if it's reasonable is that sufficient? Assessment? Yes. Uh, if, if, that's, if that's a reasonable assessment, then absolutely, that's, that's, that's something. We, we would have internal guidance around about this and training for our staff. And indeed, this is, this is an issue that arises across other OMAs and organisations because similar provisions they have there. So 
it can be a difficult area because it is such a subjective judgment, but it is one that we put a lot of effort, we have put a lot of effort into and training our staff and getting them up to speed to make sure those decisions are correct. So if someone could have taken a judicial review but misses the, the three month time limit, uh, does that make it easier for them? Well, again, it comes down to, is it reasonable for them to, uh, to have that alternative legal remedy? And if it's not, then absolutely that would come into the, the, the decision making on that. So the, the decision as to whether it's reasonable to have the alternative remedy is at that moment in time? Well, of course, we're assessing it when they bring it to the Ombudsman. Is, it, is, is there at that point a reasonable alternative re yeah. legal remedy? Well, if you've missed the window for judicial review, that may well be one of the That might be the smart thing, thing to do. Miss the window before you make your complaint to the Ombudsman. Again, there's a whole range of factors in there. We'd be happy to write to you to provide you more in terms of how we make these assessments and, and how we, we guide ourselves in making these assessments. And, and I do think it's important that we don't duplicate, and I think that provision is there to prevent us from duplicating any role. We are that different and separate role yeah. from, from the courts, as, as you well know. Um, but again, happy to provide follow-up detail. Yeah. And, and I do think one of the things I wanted to do was maybe just draw attention to, so if you look at things like the matters outside our jurisdiction, while for some things that might be relatively straightforward, actually for others it can be really complex about whether or not the matters in our jurisdiction, and we will often have to recourse to our internal legal advice to decide that. So it's so even though that can look like oh they all fall outside and we've done we've just made that decision, often there is a very complex decision making process behind that, taking into account a huge number of factors. Just one other uh, separate point. You've told us the number of complaints and I appreciate it's it's hard to compare the receipt of the number of complaints in any given year with the outcomes. But in the year you're reporting on, just remind us how many complaints were upheld. Oh, sorry, I need to go back to my notes. <coughs> so, of all the cases that we took to final stage, 72% yes. were upheld, either fully or partially. And if you look across all of our cases that went first stage or final stage, it is around between 45 and 50 per cent identified issues or failings that required some form of resolution. So, so how does that relate to the percentage of complaints you initially receive in a year? So, so yeah, so that, that um, if I may, may come in, just the, the 40 to 50 per cent where there are some issues that require some form of resolution. Um, that would be as a percentage of the figure accepted into those assessment investigation stages, the two investigative stages, which is so the does that mean, 35. Does that mean over 50 per cent there's no issue found? Absolutely. And, 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 I, and I think that is that's something that is consistent, again, with, with many other ombudsmen around about that figure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Emma, can I bring you in, please? Can you hear me okay? Um, my, my question was around, um, so the majority of the, the, the complaints that come into the departments, 50% um, of them go to the Department of Communities and is it around um, the high levels of complaints to the department is around the um, payment, personal independent payment? Um, so can you kind of get, clarify um, like how many complaints in total were relating to personal independent? payment and um, if the Ombudsman has made any recommendations um, on how the personal independent payment scheme should be changed in the way it delivers given the vast number of um, complaints that are received about it. Um, so um, some of the detail of that I might have to come back to you on but when you look at Department for Communities it's actually made up primarily of complaints around three benefits. So one is, is PIP, the personal independent payments. One is universal credit, which in the last, in the current year we are in, is, is generating a number of complaints. And the other one is about employment support payments. So if we have um, particular issues in relation to those, and, and we do an investigation and, and we will make recommendations, but over and above that, as I raised with committee, um, we decided, the previous Ombudsman, Ray Anderson, decided that um, PIP 
should be the subject of our first own initiative investigation and that was for a number of issues that was due to the quantity and nature of the complaints that were coming to the office it was due to what was happening externally in terms of people's experience of that including I think the experiences of many MLAs and their constituency offices and that report um, is now in its very first draft stage and is with the department for comment around factual accuracy when that report is complete um, which I hope it will be certainly by early in the new year we I am happy to bring that report back the, the um, own initiative focused really specifically on the role of further medical evidence in that process so it went from initial assessment all the way through to lapsed appeal or appeal and looked at how further medical evidence was used and um, we used a case sample of 100 cases and we went into capita and took those cases from their source and did an absolutely detailed investigation and um, so i think once we're at the point of being able to publish that i would really welcome the opportunity to come back and talk to committee in more detail about that element of the work um, but I can certainly get you a little bit more, if you would like, on the PIP complaints to date and what we've said about them. Yeah, I think we'd all welcome that. Emma, do you have anything further? No. Are you satisfied? Lovely. Margaret, all done. Thank you very much. I don't think we have anything further for you. And I'd be grateful then, in due course, whenever your annual report is so available, that you'll, you'll furnish us with those. That's lovely, and we look forward to it. Thank you, and thanks Thank for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, members, if I can refer you then to uh, you have correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee at pages 99 and 100 of your pack, uh, as agreed. Previously, this was copied onto the Northern Ireland Audit Office on receipt of this correspondence. So, are you content uh, that we ask the Audit Office to formally respond to PAC? Yes? All right. Right, you'll also note then the follow up. Um, the Audit Office has sent through the information that we requested, and we're going to consider that in further detail at the next committee when hopefully we'll have more information with regard to the budgets. So, content to note that for the interim. Yes, yep. lovely. <coughs> and presumably nobody is coming in via Starley from the audit office. All right. Not for this session, Chair. Hello, Pamela. Hello, Rodney. Hi, it's good to see you back with us. Thank you very much. Um, we are slightly pressed for time today because we have to vacate the room to allow for training for the next committee to come in. Okay. So I would invite you to make your opening statement, but could I please <coughs> ask, and you'll please bear with me on this, I apologise, but could I ask you to restrict your remarks to three minutes, please? Thank well, you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that. Um, not a problem at all. If asked Rodney to do the opening statement today, just an annual report and accounts, uh, it's corporate service team compile this, and they've put a lot of hard work in over the past number of months, so... I've asked Rodney. him to, we'll keep him to time. I'll right. <laughs> Over to you, Rodney. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Chair, members. Um, thanks for having us again this afternoon. Our annual report in accounts 2019-20 um, was laid before the Assembly on the 24th of September. It's prepared in line with guidance issued by the Department of Finance, DAO 0120, and is prepared in compliance with the accounting principles and disclosure requirements of the Government Financial Reporting Manual, FREM, which is issued by Treasury. Um, its format is therefore consistent with 17 other sets of uh, financial statements. That includes the nine main government departments, the Assembly Commission and IPSO. The document itself, as in your pack, runs to some 98 pages, but effectively it's, it can be divided quickly into three components. I'll just quickly offer a commentary on each of those. The performance report in the first instance gives you an overview of who we are, what we do, um, and it contains commentary from our board chairperson and our CNAG. Um, it contains an analysis of our performance for the year, a high-level summary of the resource accounts, um, in simple terms, how we have spent the funding that we granted. The accountability report, um, by page count, is actually over 40% of the document. It contains our corporate governance report, our governance statement detailing the structure and arrangements in place for the year under review. And the accountability report also contains our remuneration and staff report. That includes the specifics for each member of the senior management team and indeed our non-executives. And it also includes the key accountability statements that are required by the Assembly, including the statement of uh, 
assembly supply and the technical. Those finally, members, the third part of the document, financial statements. In old language, um, or indeed in the language that I trained with, that's essentially the income and expenditure account balance sheet, the accounting policies, mm -hmm. and the other notes to the accounts um, detailing the net expenditure, fee income, staff costs, other costs, assets, and liabilities. So there's a lot in the annual report and accounts. Um, a question that we're often asked is <clears throat> who audits the auditors? So for our external audit um, of our annual report and accounts, we're audited by Baker Tilly Mooney Miller. So their audit certificate on opinions is at pages 72 to 75. It's a clean certificate with the opinions on qualified, but unusually this year it contains an emphasis of matter paragraph, um, drawing attention to the uncertainty around the property valuation for our own building because of COVID. And that position that has been adopted by Baker Tilly Mooney Moore is consistent with the position adopted by the CNAG in relation to many of the financial statements that we're currently auditing, including indeed the assemblies. And finally, Chair, um, Page 10 sets out various challenges and developments in our operating environment and gives a flavour of the key risks and issues. <clears throat> in closing the brief very quickly, I draw members' attention to page 26, I thought it was worth highlighting. It's a six-year trend line on our uh, resource outturn and it sets out quite clearly the reductions, um, but also how we've reached kind of a turning point in that trend line in the 1920 year, which is under review, and hopefully gives members a flavour of what we've been talking to you about as a committee and where we would like to start going to on our budgetary requirements um, in the years forward to ideally bring our staffing levels up to 125 FTEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And folks, could I just thank you very much for supplying us the information we'd requested at the previous meeting. Thank you very much. Could I open it now? Uh, any members who, have, who may have questions? Uh, yes, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I should declare an interest because the matter I'm going to ask you about, I suppose, could be said to have some relationship with a meeting I had with you, both of you, some months ago. But I wanted to ask about the role of the Audit Office via the local government. And there seems there is this system whereby a staff member is allocated to work with a particular council, presumably more than one. Would you just explain that facility to me? I picked that up as the local government auditor. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you're quite right. Um, I think we gave some context, um, possibly at the last meeting, just of the changes over the past 10, for context in the audit office, from CNAG's responsibility purely for central government audit. Um, at a point in time, health services audit would have sat outside of that, as did local government audit. And a number of years ago, that was all brought into the audit office. Um, the role and responsibility is that the CNAG will nominate a member of the NIAO staff uh, to be the local government auditor and that's in consultation and agreement with the Department for Communities. So that's me in this context. Um, within the operational rollout of those audits, um, I mean one of the things we have changed over the past number of years is that none of that work sits in silos anymore so there's not just a health team doing health audit or a local government team doing local government audit or central. And indeed, those teams will undertake both the financial audit and any value for money studies that's relevant to the portfolio that they've got. So a number of directors in the audit office will have the portfolio of the 11 councils, for instance, spread across them. Um, and yes, if there are, they're responsible for the financial audit for that council. And if we get any concerns raised to us or any issues brought to us with regards to that council, that director in the first instance with myself will look into what those issues are. So does one director cover one council or does one director cover more than one? One director will cover more than one. How many? It's varied. We have four of the audits that are contracted out and they report into a director with uh, two other councils and then a second director will cover the remaining councils. And does that director uh, stay affiliated with that council for several years? Similar, I mean, right across the audit office, part of our quality review uh, process and our monitoring and our ethics. Uh, we have a rotation policy in the office, uh, which is five years with a potential of up to two. So no director will uh, continue to remain with their clients more than five or seven years, wherever we deem that appropriate. Do you, do you all think that's too long? Because is there not a risk of that director becoming too cosy in the relationship with the council? 
No, I don't believe so. It's a balance. I mean, we do that in line with guidance. Um, so we're consistent with uh, accounting guidance in that and regulations in that. Well, you're uh, aware, for example, something brought to your attention about a director affiliated to a council, instead of dealing with an issue, is saying the main issue here is to repair relations with the officers. I'm not at all. Um, I mean, as we receive any issues, I will be aware of all issues that come to the office with regards to local government, uh, Karen, very much so with regards to uh, central government. Those will be uh, investigated and looked into and pursued. Um, but there is a balance between if we rotated teams off audits on an annual basis, we wouldn't have the same level of experience, understanding of that organisation. So it's important to have an element of continuity. Um, but the rotation is important. We also, as an office, every member of staff will uh, annually uh, complete um, any conflicts of interest that they would have. So if they have friends, family, whatever, in any audited bodies, um, obviously we take that into consideration as to whether it's appropriate that they uh, are involved. And if you get a complaint that the director didn't adequately investigate a matter, what happens with that? During the course of any investigation, I will be aware of what's going on and we will feed back to those involved. Um, so before anything goes out, I would need to be satisfied as local government auditor with that. Um, if the individual is not satisfied, that then comes into our complaints process in line with our policy in the office. And how is that handled? We've, we, I mean, it's, I think we've included some information around our complaints policy. It's also in our annual report and our policy is online, but we have a three-stage process to any complaints that come into the office as to how those are reviewed and investigated. Okay. Just, just if I may, Pamela, on the back of that before bringing in on. Just... Thanks. Uh, Thanks. It's just uh, in relation to um, a complaint that's, that's, that's brought to you or a concern that's brought to you, and you undertake, your department undertakes to look into it. Uh, do you have a process of keeping the person who brought that to your attention updated on the progress of, of your investigations and deliberations? Or do you sort of maintain radio silence until you've come to a conclusion? It's just in, in my own experience, um, the onus seems to be on the person making the complaint to keep contacting you mm -hmm. to try and get the right person, to try and get some sort of response. And in most cases, it's just very much a holding remark rather than a proper update of what's going on. So. No, I do recognise. I mean, we, we certainly recognise as part of good practice in our policy that it is good to keep those individuals informed of, of how progress is going. Sometimes things can be resolved fairly quickly. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but your point is valid that for us to keep the individual informed as to what that progress is looking like is something that we would absolutely aspire to. We recognise that to be good practice. I think it is important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I just ascertain Paul, with regard to the five years and then the two years? Yes. Um, how, do, how do you reach those figures and what's the rationale for a potential extension? Um, there's, there's a couple of, I mean, in the main we hold to five years. We, that would be deemed as good practice. Um, if there's a change in the team below, so it's, it's for all the members involved in that audit, so if there's been a, a, you know, a change in the turnover of the team below, there could be merit in looking at the continuity, maybe at director level, for instance, um, or if there have been significant issues in a particular audited body uh, that are significant or high risk, there could be merit in considering that as part of the extension process, but we go through that on an annual basis. Our technical team um, engage with me and all the um, directors on, for the whole teams, not just the directors. So that rotation's looked at right across the office. And how often would it be that the extension of two years would be granted? It honestly will vary. In the main, we try to hold to that five years. We see that as, the, as good practice, back to an earlier point, that balance between continuity of knowledge, um, but at the same time, not, not risking any conflict. Again, the point made. So in the main, we seek to go to five years. Um, but on, the, on occasions, uh, if we feel it's meritorious, it's within our policy to go to seven. Thank you. I, I just have a couple more, if I may. Um, just, I know that you, since 2018 you've had a new governance structure, and you yes. say that, that has bedded in, uh, and that relates to your advisory board, your ARAC, and your remuneration uh, committee. Yes. Could you please give us 
some indication as to what your governance structure was previously, um, so therefore what the changes have been, and could you also indicate uh, what made you decide to instigate the business transformation programme? Okay, BTP. If I seen the governance changed as I come in. Maybe, Rodney, do you want to sort of explain the previous governance and then I pick up in BTP? Is that okay? Um, <clears throat> I suppose my starting point would be we moved from, we used to have what was called an advisory group to the CNIG. Um, we now have an advisory board, so the whole membership of that was changed. Um, and we went out to the marketplace and, um, and recruited new members and we had a, an MLA on that panel um, who was part of that in terms of recruiting the members, the membership of it. Um, in, in the previous structure, I would have thought that there was a bit of um, the terms of reference for each of the individual components was not clear, and we didn't have a remuneration committee on the previous structure, so that was brand new since um, the 2018 period chair that you refer to. Um, so those, those to my mind, would be pivotal changes. Um, I wouldn't, if I may, I wouldn't underestimate the amount of impact that the changes in people has. Um, and, and the rigour that went into that process to put in place the new advisory board uh, back in 2018. Um, and our chairperson, in fact, hopefully our chairperson at some stage will deem it appropriate to come here to talk to you, um, is a retired um, senior partner from one of the very large four um, firms, accountancy firms. Um, and previously with the advisory group, how were those people appointed? Was it the same way as it is currently with the advisory board? Or was there a different process? <coughs> no, there was a very similar process, Chair. Um, we put much more effort in this time to the recruitment process and supporting it, and, it and, and um, going out into the marketplace and, and maybe, if I may say so, offering up the attractiveness of the positions. Um, whereas previously, there maybe was a more limited pool of, of applicants. And, and what made you, what made you decide there needed to be a change? Well, there had to be a change anyhow because the contracts that the previous people were, were due for renewing. So, so it was a good, it was a good and opportune time to sit back and look afresh at it, and, and really look at the other audit institutions across um, the UK and see how they go about their business. So, we constantly benchmark ourselves with with others. Um, you know, why reinvent the wheel if we can see something somewhere else that that, that could work well for us? Okay, thank you, Pamela. So are you going to come back to me about business transformation program? Um, really. Um, BTP, um, we're, as you know, we're in the process now of redoing our corporate plan. So uh, we started that in the autumn of 2017. And again, within the annual report, it outlines what those three strategic objectives are for the organisation. So really, BTP was our mechanism of delivering that. So beyond recognising our core delivery of financial audit, public reporting, etc., um, against those objectives around adding assurance and contributing into the transformation of public service, Looking in at ourselves, you know, we identified key things that we wanted to progress as an organisation. So really the, the programme was really to say, if these are our corporate objectives beyond core delivery, what are the things we need to do or we want to do uh, to improve our operating environment, both from our audit practice, our staffing, et cetera, our accommodation, that will enable us to deliver out on our corporate objectives. So we put them together as a real visual of knowing how they all contribute together to deliver out our objectives rather than just have projects, single projects sitting about. It was really a cohesiveness to bring it together that we could see that by doing these things, um, they will deliver out our corporate objectives of the organisation. Thank you very much. do you have anything? Are you happy enough? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Members satisfied? Jim, you uh, uh, if there's, is there still yes, time? Yes, there's still time. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the issue about the, co the corporate governance. This um, uh, this board that exists, the chair, of course, uh, is appointed by the by Mr. Donnelly and the all the non-executive members. Is that right? That that's correct. Uh, yes, and as a result of a panel interview with with others on the panel with him. Yes, but he he whose empire is being uh, scrutinised, as it were, so far as that board does scrutinise it, he makes the appointment of the chair and the non-executive members. He does. He does. His capacity of corporation, so that's correct. 
And then your website says that that board, for example, will meet four times a year. Has it been doing that? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Well, the last time I looked at your website, it met once in 2018, according to the minutes. And it met three times, according to your minutes, in 1920. Right. Potentially, I'm intrigued with the 18. I need to check that. I think, yes, in, in the 1920 year, it met three times. It didn't meet the four. Yes. In addition to that, the advisory board also meets in a workshop capacity uh, within the organisation, so that would be significantly supplemented throughout the year. Are there additional dates for that in the report? Are there are additional dates for all these meetings? There's certainly more since March. Um, I mean, we had a, a workshop with the board um, a couple of weeks ago. And indeed, there's a second meeting for the 3rd of December. So it was something that um, the board had an appetite uh, to meet four times a year. A few weeks ago, the website showed only two meetings in 19... It was a workshop a few weeks ago. That and meeting. now there's been a third one added, even though it's six, seven months since that meeting happened. Has someone been tidying up the presentation? Would it? I need to take up with the team. Um, I'm just looking at the, annual, at the our annual report on page 46. Yes. So, uh, it met three times in 1920, 30th of May, the 8th of October, and the 11th of February. Yes. Well, the 11th um, of February was not on the minutes, was not on the website yeah, until very recently. I'd need to check then through the chair, I'd need to check when the board met subsequent to the 11th of February, but that minutes. subsequent meeting would clear the minutes and agree yeah. the minutes and only then would they go on the website. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, have there been any private meetings which wouldn't go on the website? Private meetings? Well, meetings that wouldn't, that the minutes off wouldn't appear? No. No. There was a workshop. I was going to say it's not a meeting. Minute, prepared of a workshop, which yep. is to um, develop our strategy in and around our corporate planning process. Yep. But there is a short minute prepared for that. And just on your risk um, uh, assurance committee. Yeah. Your report says that it met on the twenty fifth of November, nineteen. There's no such minute on the website. I will check that and come back to the committee, yeah. Chair. Um, I hope that that's just an oversight, but I'll check it and get clarity for the committee as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Members, don't have anything else? In that case, yeah. Pamela, Rodney, thank you very much thank for coming. No doubt we'll see you again in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you, you folks. Budgetary stuff we'll have to go through, so thank you very much indeed. And we trust then you'll just um, give that information back to the parks and then yeah, we'll check pass it through. That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. So, uh, members, if I can turn your attention to item 10, which is correspondence. My understanding is that we don't have any further <coughs> correspondence. Uh, and then we move to any other business. Trudy, you've got one about monitoring round information. Yes, through the chair. Um, following the main estimates debate that happened on Monday, um, it may be prudent if the committee requested some follow-up information in respect of bids and easements from the non-ministerial bodies in respect of the October monitoring round, um, it, it would be normal practice for the committee to receive such briefing. So if members yep. are content with yep. that. Yes, content. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. That's agreed. So the date and time of the next meeting we already discussed at the start. Provisionally we're looking at the 25th of November, again at 12.15 until 1.45 in this room. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I'll keep members informed if, if I hear anything from the Department of Finance about scheduling mm -hmm. that closer to the time. So, can we, go on for, can, can we just have enough then for me to end the meeting? Going well, to just for you to, uh, mm -hmm. we agreed today. I'm oh, sorry, that was in this private session. Well, so I, uh, I'm going to go into yeah, closed yeah, session yeah, just yeah, briefly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're now going into closed session. Okay.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.